Hi, I'm Drew Youngdike, and welcome to the National Wildlife Federation Outdoors Podcast. Now, you may have noticed that our name has changed. After starting under the name of Conservation Country, we just recently decided to switch up and change and go with the moniker of the National Wildlife Federation Outdoors Podcast. And this is part of coinciding with our new branding of our Hunter and Angler outreach work. So we're really excited to bring these two uh, mediums uh, together under that name. Um, You'll still hear the same great content, but we are going to make a few changes going forward. So we have averaged about one podcast per month, although it's been a little bit sporadic, um, since we launched last summer. And we're going to keep with that one per month long form interview about a serious conservation topic or an interview with a conservation leader as we have done. But moving forward, we're also going to add a weekly short rundown of the conservation news of the week every Friday in between. So from here on out, what you're going to come to expect is a new, sorry, I almost said conservation country again, a new National Wildlife Federation outdoors podcast every Friday. Once a month, that will be a long form, serious deep dive on a conservation issue or with a conservation leader. And the other three per month will be those quick news roundups of the important conservation news of the week that we're working on here at the National Wildlife Federation that is of interest to hunters, anglers, and outdoor recreationists. This episode, I've got actually Mark Smith, who is our Director of Conservation Partnerships in the Great Lakes region, and we're going to explore in depth the entire history of the effort to keep Asian carp out of the Great Lakes. As always, this podcast is supported by a conservation partnership with Rep Your Water. Rep Your Water donates 3% of all of their sales to conservation causes, and if you purchase Great Lakes, Michigan, Indiana, or Ohio gear, they'll donate 3% of that to us. They've also collaborated with us on special edition Asian cart merchandise. Right now you can get a sticker for your fly box or your back window that says Stop Asian Cart. And they donate 50% of that to the National Wildlife Federation for our work on stopping Asian carp that you're gonna hear about in this podcast. And very soon we'll have a special limited edition hat that you'll be able to get as well for for your days on the water. So without further ado, here is Mark Smith, on the National Wildlife Federation Outdoors Podcast. Hi, I'm Drew Youngdike, and this is the National Wildlife Federation's Conservation Country Podcast. I'm coming to you from the Great Lakes Regional Center in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And for this episode, I have my boss, Mark Smith, our Director of Conservation Partnerships for the Great Lakes region, who has an extensive history with Asian carp. And on this episode, what we're going to do is we're going to take a deep dive into the issue of Asian carp invading our waters in the U.S., the threat that they pose to the Great Lakes, and the whole history of how we've gotten to this point in time with a recommended management action that could keep them out of the Great Lakes. We're going to look at where that stands, how they got here, and a little bit more about how they are managed where the funding comes from, and what you as a conservationist can do to help stop them. So without further ado, here is Mark Smith. He is the National Wildlife Federation's Director of Conservation Partnerships for the Great Lakes region. And actually, Mark was just appointed to the Great Lakes Commission by Michigan Governor Governor Gretchen Whitmer. So Mark, uh, welcome to the podcast. Well, good morning. Thanks for having me, Drew. So you were just recently appointed to the Great Lakes Commission. Could you tell me what does that appointment mean? What is a Great Lakes Commission? Well, uh, first of all, I'm quite honored to be uh, appointed by the governor. Um, It's a pretty important role because the Great Lakes Commission was established, I think back in the 50s, to help facilitate um, the management of the Great Lakes um, amongst all the states that have Great Lakes border and, 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 um, and also to help coordinate roles with Canada because we share this Great Lakes water bodies with our partners to the north. So it's a, it's an opportunity for um, us to work together, find collaborations, um, figure out ways to coordinate on management, figure out ways to coordinate on research and really help set um, more of an advocacy role for the Great Lakes together uh, to Congress, whether it means getting funding for the Great Lakes, whether it means promoting actions to keep invasive species out, um, control algal blooms, 
uh, toxic hotspots, areas of concern that have, you know, decades uh, history of, of pollution and with toxics. Um, so it's kind of a, a, a very needed role that um, uh, I'm really humbled and honored to, to serve. Well, well, it's certainly deserved. You have a very long history, both with, with the Asian carp issue and advocating for the Great Lakes. Um, how long have you been with the National Wildlife Federation now? It will be, uh, let's see, 19 years this this summer, um, and it seems much much shorter than that because every day I come to work and I love it. I mean, every day I try to make a difference for wildlife, and it's just kind of a, one of those things where I can't actually believe I'm getting paid to do what I do. So I started out in D.C. Uh, working for the NWF D.C. office and advocate for public land. So I really cut my teeth with NWF, banging my head up against the wall to make sure that the the George Bush energy bill was not as dangerous as it was proposed to do against wildlife and oil and gas development out west. So I did a lot of lobbying to make sure that whatever energy bill came out uh, made sure that they did um, safeguards for wildlife, clean water, etc. So that was uh, where I started and then moved out here. Uh, 2004-ish time frame and uh, kind of transferred from public lands to the Great Lakes and I've kind of established this as my home. Love it here and I love what I do uh, every day to keep our Great Lakes great. Now before we get into the issue of Asian carp, um, I think it's important especially for, for our audience of, of, of hunters and anglers and conservationists to understand to your personal love for these resources that we have. And, and I say this because um, when, I, when I peeked over your cubicle earlier today, I saw you holding up a big bass that was bigger than any I've caught. Um, I, I know that you're a pretty avid fly angler, um, that, that you hunt rough grouse. Uh, what, what are your favorite outdoor activities to take advantage and enjoy the natural resources that you spend your professional time protecting? Yeah. Well, as my dad always jokes, he cannot believe that I actually get paid to do what I do and I get paid to go out and enjoy hunting and fishing and going to see some pretty cool places and taking in all the sights here in the Great Lakes. But yeah, I grew up as a kid, you know, in the woods and waters of Virginia um, with my brothers and I going down the Creek catching um, uh, minnows so we can put on our hooks to catch smallmouth uh, and largemouth in some of the bays and some of the rivers in Virginia. Um, so I kind of grew up with that ethic. Um, you know, when I was 10 years old, a lot of kids were getting Transformers and um, Legos. And I asked my mom for a Simon & Schuster's Guide to Birds of North America. I still have that book. It's awesome. Um, so I've always had an ethic of, you know, protecting wild places and, um, and a, not just for protection, but for using. And I love to get out in the woods and hunt grouse. Um, my dad kind of got me into that. Um, love to see the dogs work. Uh, my my yellow lab uh, isn't the best hunter, but she likes to run around and kind of uh, pretend like she's hunting. <laughs> um, she has flushed up a couple of grouse over the years, but um, yeah, it, it's one of those things I love to do. Um, and you know, I, I like to consider myself a fly angler. Um, I know the fish are there; that makes me happy. Doesn't mean I have to catch them. Like I cast uh, uh, not so well, but just good enough to actually be a little bit dangerous. So, and that's kind of one of the things I love those outdoor pursuits and which makes my work even more uh, meaningful because I know the things that I'm doing are going to help pass on some of those legacies for my kids and, and, and everyone who lives up here in the Great Lakes area. And if you go back and listen to our, our last podcast episode with uh, Jason Dinsmore, who's, who's the other director of conservation partnerships for this region and also the interim executive director for the Minnesota Conservation Federation, we talked a little bit about um, a staff grouse hunt that we that we do with uh, the folks from Michigan United Conservation Clubs, uh, two up at Jason's property. And this this last fall, I think Mark and Jason were the only ones to land to land some grouse, um, and and actually be successful. Both hunting, I, I would like to add with a non toxic shot as well. So yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's okay. It's the, the the good thing about hunting grouse is that yeah, if 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 it was so easy, we wouldn't do it, right? I mean, you know, and sometimes they're not there, sometimes they're there. So it's just, it's one of those things. I mean, grouse habitat is, uh, has been um, really a high priority for the Michigan DNR. I mean, they've really become almost in a lot of ways the grouse um, capital of the world um, in some regards because we've, we've really dedicated to a good sustainable forest management system 
which grouse need. So, um, so we're happy to live here. But yeah, it doesn't mean just because grouse are there and every time you go out does not guarantee you a grouse. It's just, uh, it's just the way it is. And you got to be a quick shot, which is good. So. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's why I miss. I had one that seemed like it was just like floating in front of me, tempting me to, to shoot it. And uh, I was just so slow on, on, the, on the draw, if you will, that uh, by the time I, I, I put a bead on it, it was gone. So, um, yeah, Mark, Mark and Jason were both successful in that one. Um, but now let's, let's get into kind of the meat of, of why we're talking here, and that's uh, Asian carp. So my experience with Asian carp um, as an issue goes back to 2009 um, when I was, uh, actually 2010 when I was finishing up law school. I did a, I did a kind of a law school thesis on the, the lawsuits that were going on at the time with the state of Michigan trying to sue the state of Illinois to shut down the, the lock south of Chicago. And that was kind of my, my intro. And as, as I was doing the research for, for that, I kept coming across the name of Mark Smith with the National Wildlife Federation being quoted in newspaper articles and, and such. So long before I came here to work, I was already familiar with Mark's involvement in the work on, the, on, the, on this issue. Um, Mark, how long have you been working on trying to keep Asian carp out of the Great Lakes. When did this kind of first come on the radar for the National Wildlife Federation? Yeah, it's a good question. It's been a long time because uh, when I first moved out here in 2004, we knew carp were making their way up from the southern states. I mean, you know, our Fish and Wildlife Service actually introduced carp, um, silver and big head, into um, the states back in the late 70s, early 80s to address um uh, concerns from farmers about algae in, in the stock ponds, and and so they use uh, the carp to come in there because they're fil- they're filter feeders. They eat algae and, and and all the particles and nutrients in the water column. So they're really good at clearing out um, uh, ponds. And so, as you would suspect from flooding, they were uh, they swam over from flooding into the Arkansas River, made their way up to the Mississippi, and they've been coming steadily north ever since. So up here in the Great Lakes, we always knew that they were a threat, but uh, didn't really hit code red level until like 2007, 2008, when uh, evidence of Asian carp was found above a set of electrical barriers outside of the Chicago area that were actually put in uh, to keep the uh, round goby uh, from the Great Lakes, leaving the Great Lakes and going through this canal system and, and spreading out into the Mississippi, the Missouri River. So there was a defense mechanism that's electrical currents in the water that repels fish species from, from moving. And that was our only line of defense that we had. Yet we found evidence of, of silver and bighead carp above that on the lake side of this. And so that just freaked everyone out. And, you know, all, all hands on deck approach towards this. Um, and it was interesting looking back now uh, what originally when we first got this evidence of carp above electrical barriers, I mean, Michigan especially launched lawsuits against Illinois, closed the locks in Chicago, you know, right down. If you've ever been in Chicago, there's a, there's a right at Navy Pier, there's a lock system there. People were yelling to close the locks there um, and because they had no sense of, of where they were. They thought that the Great Lakes, it was over, that the Great, Great Lakes would be taken over by Asian carp and we would have jumping silver carp taking over and you know, destroying um, the economic, the robust economic um, uh, uh, value we have here on the commercial and sport fishery. I mean, $7 billion annually, I think, in the Great Lakes alone, uh, $15 billion boating industry. Um, it was just a, a kind of a shock to the system. And so lawsuits went everywhere. It was very aggressive. Um, so about 2007, 2008, where we really had to drop everything and almost exclusively for me uh, work on this issue. And so it's been um, a decade's worth of work for me on this issue. And, and you mentioned that everybody was, was freaked out when that happened. Why is everybody freaked out about Asian carp? What do they do to the water bodies that, that they invade? What have they done up and down the Mississippi as they've made their way up? So I, I think maybe a lot of people hear the term Asian carp, maybe they think about jumping silver carp, but maybe they don't understand exactly what they do to a water body and the native fishery or the, or the, a lot of, well, in a lot of cases it may not be the native 
fishery, but the, the planted sport fishery that yeah. that sustains those water bodies. Um, what what do they do to other fish? Yeah, yeah. So they're not traditional. Like you can't just go out and just with a hook and just catch them. They're just not. They just don't do that. They're filter feeders. So they're very difficult to catch. And in, in, in regards to the silver carp, and there's there's four types of there's actually five types of carp. There's there's the silver carp, which um, they're the ones that jump. If you go to YouTube and just type in jumping silver carp or Asian carp, you'll see them and you'll understand what we're talking about here. Then there's the big head carp, and they can get up to almost 60, 70 pounds. And they don't jump, but thank goodness they don't. Then there's the, um, the black carp. They particularly um, eat mussel, freshwater mussels and river systems. The grass carp is another one. They're more um, uh, water vegetation, so they have a huge impact on waterfowl. Um, and other species that rely upon some of the grasses in the waters. And then there's common carp, which is, which is just typical what you see typically everywhere. But the silver and the big head are the real threats, um, and they don't. Um, uh, they, they just go through the water column with their mouths opens and the filter feed. So what? Why is that bad? Because they take out all the nutrients and all the um, uh, the food, uh, the, the, the you know the, the food base for all the other sport fish that we care about. They out they out compete. Smallmouth, they outcompete um, long, uh, largemouth, they outcompete pike, they outcompete um, buffalo, the sunfishes, all the the fishes that whitefish, all the fish that we really really care about, um, they outcompete them, and then there I think there are actually some certain stretches in the in the Illinois River and around Peoria, Illinois, that Asian carp take over about an eighty to ninety percent of the biomass in the river systems there. That's ridiculous, I and mean, that's that's just a total. Um, pushing out of all the native species that we care about. So they come in to a water body, take it over, and, and completely push out all the native species that we want. I mean, some, some, some scientists predict that silver and big head can, can um, spawn two, at least two, sometimes three times a year. That's ridiculous amount of, of fish. And they can lay uh, up to, you know, hundreds of eggs per fish. So we're talking at um, uh, an enormous impact to whatever fish species where they come in um, and you know we've, we've heard the phrase silver and big head carp eat like uh, or breed like mosquitoes and eat like hogs so that's what we're talking about here no one wants these things um, no one wants to be catching big head instead of uh, desirable uh, walleye and perch and, and, and largemouth and smallmouth those what we that's what drives our economy um, drives the quality of life and why we actually live up here in this area. And no one wants uh, Asian carp to, to take over uh, and push out those native species. So a lot of people in Michigan, in Wisconsin, in the Great Lakes region started becoming aware or hyper aware of the, of the Asian carp issue about 10 years ago. And one thing that I keep hearing is people saying, well, why haven't they done anything in 10 years? Um, I think there's a little bit of a of an error to that assumption because there have definitely been management actions and even some some closures of pathways that have taken place in recent years. Um, but starting about ten years ago, what was the re, what was the response that kind of led to to the proposals that we're seeing now? Mm -hmm. Congress got got involved, the the Army Corps of Engineers um, and groups like the National Wildlife Federation advocated for solutions. Um, Going back to to those early days about a decade ago, what what got the ball rolling that led, led us to where we are now? Yeah, so pressure from groups like NWF and the hunting and community, hunting and angling community in the Great Lakes, environmental community, uh, legislators, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, all the agencies were you know pushing Congress to do something. So actually, Congress looked at a study of how we could actually stop the transfer of invasive species between the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River Basin. And so they were looking at all the doors that were open between the two basins and, and, and had the Corps of Engineers look at ways to identify those doors. What are, where are the doors that their invasive species can transfer? And what are the potential ways that you can stop them? So through that report that was issued to Congress, or Congress authorized the Corps to study that in, I think, around 1990, I'm sorry, 2007, um, they put out a report um, about 10 years later that looked at all the vectors from Chicago, um, canal waterway system, to places in Minnesota up north, to transfer points uh, near Fort Wayne, Indiana, from the Wabash River 
that can transfer over into the Maumee River, which flows into Toledo area at Lake Erie. So they looked at all the doors that had transfer potential, um, and the biggest one being Chicago. And they looked at ways to do that and recommend to Congress, what could we do? But there were delays um, and delays from the core of looking at this study. And a lot of it had to do with the data and the um, and the, the, the groups and the stakeholders that were playing a role. You can imagine what would happen if the Corps of Engineers came up with the report and saying, we're going to close down the Chicago area waterway system to prevent carp from getting into the Great Lakes. Well, this canal system was man-made uh, you know, around 1900 when uh, the city of Chicago was, 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 was actually reversed the flow of the river. Uh, the river used to flow into Lake Michigan, but all the pollution um, that was going into the river out to Lake Michigan was their source of drinking water. So they didn't want to be pulling water from Lake Michigan that was being polluted by themselves. So instead of solving that issue, they said, well, let's just reverse the river and flow the river back down to St. Louis. So they just basically flushed their toilet down the St. Louis. So this canal system uh, uh, was created for navigation and for flood management. If 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 the, the canal system was not in Chicago, the city of Chicago would flood. I mean, right now, a lot of downtown places in Chicago still flood. So they can't just simply just pour concrete into these canals, block the water from stopping from transferring. That would just backfill basements in Chicago, so that's not going to work. So huge mitigation had to be done, you know, replumbing of Chicago. And that caused a lot of problems amongst the stakeholders, namely the shipping industry. Shipping industry still uses the canal systems to move goods, you know, salt, uh, uh, oil, uh, you know, some sand and, and concrete. There's a lot of aggregate uh, that goes through these canals um, uh, for, you know, for economic purposes. And so they were the huge opposition to this, basically every, causing everything to come to a halt. Um, so what happened, long story short, uh, the report to Congress from the Corps did not provide any recommendations. So Congress was kind of caught with nothing really to move on. Um, and so they had to figure out a way to do something. Um, to, um, and so they kept on studying um, ways to, uh, how could you physically separate? Um, and it just never made consensus. There was resistance from Illinois, resistance from the shipping industry, whereas on the other side of that were you know, Michigan, Wisconsin, Ohio, pushing to get something done. So, um, you know, that, that Chicago became like this big political fight. And it just became um, so politicized that the mention of it doing anything in the Chicago area waterway canal system to stop the transfer of carp was just toxic to the point of no action. Now, having said that, there, there, there has been some things that we have done, you know, there, there are, like, as I said, all the doors that were open that the Corps looked at. And this, just to, to interject here, this report was called the, the Glimmerous Report. Um, it, it's, a, it's a long acronym. It's a Great Lakes Mississippi River Interbasin Study. Exactly. That's why, right I, never, that's why I never <laughs> say the Glimmerous Report. I just say right. the Corps just put together a plan. I never say Glimmerous. It's just alphabet I, soup of acronyms. Because I remember I was working for Michigan United Conservation Clubs at the time, and they had one of the public hearings uh, here in Ann Arbor that I came to give our comments to. And, of course, I think at the time we, we called you up and said, hey, Mark, what are our comments on this? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. But, um, it, in, and back then, um, most of the conservation and, and hunting and fishing groups were in support of physical separation. Um, I think before it became clear that that, that was both politically un, unfeasible and, frankly, would just flood Chicago, so they're just not going to touch ec- that football. Economically. Right. Right, so the cost of... You know, it doesn't cost much to pour a set of concrete into the canal. That's that's not the cost. The cost is, all right, where does that water go now? Yeah. And how do you move that water in a way that uh, doesn't flood downtown Chicago? So huge, huge infrastructure would have to have been built to move that water away, to put it in reservoirs. And that's where the cost just went astronomically up into the billions and billions of dollars. And so you had a political... Uh, obstacle where Illinois didn't want to just stop shipping through the canal system, but you also had an economic cost. It just wasn't going to work. So overall, it just kind of became not feasible to even consider a physical separation. So 
lot of the hunting and fishing groups and a lot of the conservation community in, at large shifted and said, all right, we have to figure out a compromise here. It let's, you know, there's going to be, a, we have to get a win-win here. And that's kind of where we are now, pushing forward on a compromise plan um, that, you know, looks at allowing us to pr provide more protections to keep carp from getting into the Great Lakes, but also not stopping shipping navigation. No one, no one wants that. We, we obviously got to, we have to move goods. And so we feel that now we have actually a plan, the Brandon Road Lock and Dam, which is kind of southwest uh, of Chicago, uh, it provides a nice choke point for us to actually put on some controls on this lock, allow shipping to continue, and reduce the chance that carp can transfer and get into the Great Lakes. Um, let's back up a couple years. The Glimmer's report also mentioned um, a couple other pathways that Asian carp could, could get from the Mississippi River um, watershed into the Great Lakes watershed. Um, and a couple of those pathways have already been closed. Um, St. Anthony Falls Lock and Dam in Minnesota um, was closed in 2015 for other reasons, but um, when it was closed, that also blocked one of those pathways. Um, and then also the Eagle Berm, um, Eagle, Eagle, Marsh Eagle Marsh Berm, yeah, the, the, the Berm and Eagle Marsh in Indiana near uh, Fort Wayne. And that is, is a kind of a big marsh where flooding can, can flood from uh, the Mississippi River system um, up over into the Maumee River system, which drains into Lake Erie. So when they were able to build that berm, and um, I think it started with a fence, and then they completed it into a full... Um, three mile three point well it's almost like a full 5k three mile long berm um creates that separation so that in flood events and i think actually just what two years ago there was a flood event that tested it and the water did not breach the berm so that closed another pathway there that was identified in that report so when people say how come anything hasn't happened in 10 years actually things have happened in, in the last 10 years that report came out i think it was yeah, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say 2014 or 2015, maybe 2014. And within a couple of years, a couple of those identified pathways were already closed. Um, but this major pathway in Chicago is this one that's, that's still open. As you mentioned, there are a couple um, of electric barriers that were put in actually to keep invasive species from going the other way. Um, those early um, environmental DNA detections um, in 2007, 2008, 2009, were past those electric barriers showing that maybe those weren't foolproof. And then in 2017, um, I remember we were expecting the Army Corps of Engineers to release its, uh, its Brandon Road plan when uh, the Trump administration actually came in and delayed it by months. And, and while that was under delay, it was delayed indefinitely. We had no idea when they were actually gonna release that plan. And then something happened which, which kind of shook that plan loose in uh, June 2017. Um, a live silver carp was found nine miles from Lake Michigan mm -hmm. on, the, on the wrong side of those existing electric barriers. And along with the pressure from all the different conservation and, and hunting, fishing, and sporting groups to release that plan, I think that that discovery of that live silver carp in June 2017 kind of shook that plan loose, and the yeah. draft plan was finally released that August. Um, yeah, I would add, obviously, finding the discovery of a silver carp was big, but also, I got to say, the hunting and angling community and, and all the voices up here in the Great Lakes were relentless in pressuring um, the Trump administration to release the report. Um, and, you know, I think that those two things combined, you know, the power of uh, engaged people um, who are upset in one action really made a difference. And the icing on the cake was actually finding a silver carp. But, uh, and they did actually, um, uh, did in fact release the report, and here we are today. So. And, and Congress, and, and I should say a bipartisan coalition um, of both um, from the House of Representatives and the Senate, uh, led by uh, Bill Heisinger in the House and, and Fred Upton um, from the Republican side, Senator Debbie Stabenow, um, Marcy Kaptur, um, you know, several, several other. Um, Rob, Port Rob Portman from yeah, Ohio. From Ohio. Um, so, so senators and representatives from both parties from, from the Great Lakes region introduced the Stop Asian Carp Now Act in the spring of 2017 that really put pressure on, on the Corps to release that plan. Um, so they released the plan in, in, in August 2017. Um, 
What was in that first draft of the plan? Well, they, you know, as I said, fizzle separation was literally not going to fly. So they had to figure out a compromise and, and to figure out a compromise that would allow us to add additional protections and then allow shipping to continue. So that's the nuts and bolts of what the Brandon Road plan is. And there's a lock uh, kind of down near Joliet that provided a nice opportunity to, to build on an approach channel that would be full of technologies that would deter uh, invasive species coming forward. So it's almost like a living laboratory where they can use, um, you know, air curtains of bubbles that would repel fish. They could do flushing lock to push water away. They could um, use sound and acoustic deterrence to, to annoy and bother fish. They don't want to be in this area and combined with an another set of electrical barriers. So in a lot of so at the end of the day, you would have carp coming up. They would meet this gauntlet of, of things that they would have to get through and then the lock and then move forward uh, to, to advance. And so this, this plan really provides um, uh, an extra layer of security uh, so carp can't make it to the Great Lakes. Because again, this is below the current set of electrical barriers. So you would have redundant protections in place, which is always good, you know. Um, and so, and it really is the compromise because it really would not impact shipping outside of maybe a little bit of delays here and there for the shipping industry. Um, but it would still allow navigation to continue. So it really has become the compromise and in a lot of ways, the only, only plan that is out there now. So it is the, is the one thing that we have devoted 100% of our time uh, to getting done. And so it's a huge priority, and it is becoming the, the, the focus of the fight for Asian carp. And um, another thing that happened, I think, in, in the spring of 2017 is the U.S. Geological Survey released a report um, where they analyzed food availability for silver and bighead carp in the Great Lakes. And what they found is you know, we, you hear from some people who, who know the, the lakes that will think about the deeper parts of, uh, of the big lakes and say, you know, Asian carp can't live there. But what the USGS found was that there would be plenty of food availability, especially in the about a mile of nearshore areas hmm. all throughout the Great Lakes, um, as well as into the, the bays, uh, the river mouse, uh, the inlets for Asian carp to survive. So I, I think that that was important, too that you had a study actually showing, you know what, Asian carp really will be able to spread throughout the Great Lakes if they make it through uh, that, that gate that we're trying to close. So that draft report came out in uh, August 2017. I think the, the first comment period closed in uh, December 2017. Um, we actually organized a group of uh, 50 um, hunting, fishing, and conservation groups at that time to support that plan. That was a draft plan. They took those comments, went through some additional uh, engineering iterations, came out with the, the kind of final draft in um, the fall of 2018. And that comment period actually just closed a little over a month ago. And and remember we that there were 50 hunting, fishing, and outdoor uh, groups that signed on to that, that first draft of the plan. Uh, Mark, how many, how many of those groups signed on to this most recent version of the plan? Yeah, so we started out with uh, kind of a smaller set of groups, you know, ranging from your typical, you know, Michigan United Conservation Clubs, Wisconsin Wildlife Federation. We had American Sport Fishing Association, which was good, um, but we, we, we crushed it this last comment period. We got over 200 hunting and fishing and outdoor rec businesses uh, to sign on to our comment letter in, in support of this plan at Brandon Road to keep carp out. So literally um, organized and, and united a lot of strong and vocal groups to push for this. And I think that is is the kind of thing that we need to really get this across the finish line. Because, you know, when you have uh, uh, that amount of groups and not just from the Great Lakes. We had groups from Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee. They all get it. They and they're and the, in fact the ones that are outside the Great Lakes basin are the ones that are currently dealing with carp. So they really get it, and they're trying to fight to keep carp get, get carp out of their waters now. But they certainly don't want carp to get into any new waters, and especially a national treasure uh, as like the Great Lakes. So we crushed it with that many groups. 
And just at one point you said about you know the USGS report, you know people have this picture of if carp were allowed to get into the Great Lakes that they'd be on the open waters out of Lake Michigan. But you know what? The 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 reality is is that with most fish they're going to hug the shorelines. They're going to hug and and stay within the river systems that feed into the Great Lakes because those are like the arteries. You know that's where they spawn. That's where the food is. And quite frankly, that's where the heart and soul of the Great Lakes uh, sport fishery is. Walleye, perch, whitefish, steelhead. steelhead. They all use yeah. those tribs to, to, to spawn. That's where we fly fish for them. And then when they spawn, that's when we come in and try to get them when they're spawning. And when they go back out in the Great Lakes, we can charter fish them on boats. And so, you know, it, it's kind of one of those things where we talk about getting into the Great Lakes, but they're going to hug the shoreline, hug those warm, shallow bays like Green Bay. Um, Saginaw Bay are just perfect places for them where, where it's warm and there's plenty of forage food, uh, plenty of nutrients for them to absorb, which impacts all the other fisheries. So, um, you know, that, that, you know, so it's not just the Great Lakes. It's all the tribs and all the bays and shallow bays that uh, join with them. Yeah, I went out uh, walleye fishing with uh, Mike Avery, who's the radio host of Mike Avery Outdoors um, on Saginaw Bay last summer. And, you know, we got into some walleye, but that was just prime Asian carp habitat if they were to get in. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's also those all those inland lakes. Um, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I took a, a kayak trip last year around uh, Charlevoix, and what I did is started off in, in Lake Michigan and kayaked in through the Pine River Channel, through Round Lake, through Lake Charlevoix. And Lake Charlevoix, you know, goes all the way inland up to, to Boyne City, down to East Jordan, then connects to the Jordan River, which is a, a blue ribbon trout stream. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got a great bass fishery, walleye, um, and then you get into where you've got the trout fishery. And so you have all these different types of fishing experiences and in regions like this. And the reason I, I selected that region is that's where I'm from, but it's similar to a lot of different types of regions that you have throughout Wisconsin, on the other side of Michigan and Ontario, you have all these little um, communities that are built off of inland lake tourism. Mm. And you know, you've got these little lakes that these communities are built around their, their population swell to triple the size in the summer from people coming and renting cottages and um, renting boats and going out and fishing these lakes. Um, people, you know, water skiing and tubing and jet skiing that would be interrupted by flying silver carp. Um, <laughs> you know, you would make some of these small towns ghost towns if if the lake tourism that they depend on was impacted by Asian carp to the degree that they could be. Yeah, and just look at this. The, I mean, there's examples of that. We don't have to imagine it. It's right. happening in some of these areas down in Illinois and Missouri and Kentucky where, you know, towns, the riverfront towns have just, you know, been abandoned and you know some and it's not just your local bait fisheries it's like the communities that have um, uh, marinas that have a, a boating culture up and down in peoria no one goes out on the river anymore because you're going to get hit in the head by a silver carp you know taking your kid out on a kayak or a canoe you know and a, and a, and a house boat goes by and then you, it, it, the silver carp freak out with the sound of a motor and you have jumping carp everywhere so it's just destroyed a lot of the, the economic uh, vitality of these regions and the quality of life, um, it's just taken over. So we, we can we can imagine what that would be here, but let's look to the areas that are actually been hit as, as, the, as the poster child for what could be, uh, you know, a future up here in the Great Lakes. Right, and actually you can go back to the first episode of this podcast. We interviewed uh, Bill Cooksey, who works for our Vanishing Paradise program and actually has a, uh, a house on... Uh, Kentucky Lake. He's a really avid bass fisherman, and um, I think there was a there was an assumption maybe that that Asian carp wouldn't hurt bass fisheries mm. as much. I think for a while they were thinking, well, maybe they'll reduce some of the competition for for bass, and and I'd heard that theory. Well, if you look at what's happening in Kentucky and Barkley Lakes, um, that will disabuse you of that notion quickly. And talking <laughs> to Bill. Um, you know, it really did in, impact the bass fishery and kind of the way that he described it is, you know, they'd have these, these big tournaments down there and they still do. Mm-hmm. And while some of the, the, the top fish would, would still be up there, what they're seeing is a trailing off and all of the fish down below that. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're still getting a couple of the big fish that maybe don't have as much competition, 
but there's just much uh, much fewer fish overall. Yeah. That, that quantity over quality, right? Right. There's a couple of the top quality ones, but the quantity has just been severely diminished. Um, and, and that's why the National Wildlife Federation, you know, we talk a lot, and, and Mark and I both work out of the Great Lakes office, so that's where most of our focus is. But I'm glad you mentioned uh, Tennessee. The Tennessee Wildlife Federation um, has really taken the lead down there in, in trying to work on that and getting uh, resources uh, to battle the Asian carp that they're already dealing with down there. Yeah. Um, some, yeah. Of, some of those resources come from the Great Lakes, though, too. So we mentioned... Um, some of the some of the pathways that have been closed, like uh, Eagle Marsh Berm and the St. Anthony Falls Lock and Dam, but there's also continuing management actions uh, that get funded through the Great Lakes Restoration mm-hmm. Initiative. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's about 20 million out of the 300 million annually that gets uh, dedicated to Asian carp. What are some of those management actions mm-hmm. that that help you know manage the fish that are already there? Yeah, well, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative or GLRI uh, is technically spent in the Great Lakes Basin. So um, it's, it's, and that goes towards carp management activities. So as Drew was saying, you know, you could, uh, you know, there's some fishing down uh, activities that are going on now, trying to harvest them. So there's been commercial you know, uh, harvesters that are going in and trying to net and, and gather them up and, and, you know, taking, you know, hundreds and thousands of tons of Asian carp out of the water now and you can use them for fertilizer, chop them up for fertilizer. You can chop them up and put them for cat food, or you can even serve them to college students at the University of Illinois. I mean, there's all sorts of things that you could use them for, and fishing down needs to continue. You'll never fish them out of the waters because they're just reproducing at such a high rate, but why not? It's a tool in the toolbox, use it. But that has to be combined with added protections at like Brandon Road or other things. So there are activities going on right now that's federally funded, um, some of the state agencies just don't have the resources to to fund some of these activities at the at the at the level that is needed. I mean, you're talking the Upper Mississippi, you're talking the Ohio River that goes from you know as far as, as St. Louis all the way up to Pennsylvania. Huge chunk of states and fisheries chiefs in these states are just up in arms trying to deal with this and trying to get federal support behind this. And so we've been working hard to get f- increased federal support. For fishing down and, and control technologies, research, monitoring, you know, trying to figure out where they are. What's the best research and technology and uh, things that we can do to reduce populations? You know, there's so much that needs to be done, and and, and it just kind of talks. It just shows you that this is not just a Great Lakes problem. This is it's really a national problem, I and mean, it comes all the way down from Louisiana all the way up the middle part of the country, uh, up into the far stretches of Minnesota. It's a huge chunk of our country is dealing with an Asian carp problem one way or the other. And so the best strategy is not to address these things on a sub-basin level one at a time, you know, here in the Great Lakes or the Upper Miss or the Ohio or Kentucky or, you know, the Cumberland River. Let's, let's, let's address this together and nationalize this thing because we're going to need votes from all these states to get more federal funding. We're going to need votes from all these states that are dealing with CARP uh, to finalize this Brandon Road plan. So why why not unite all these states and, and address this as a problem nationally? Because these river systems are connected. If you had a map, you can just see the, the, the basin impacts. The Missouri River connects to the Mississippi. The Missouri River goes all the way up through the Dakotas into uh, the far stretches of Montana. I mean, this, Lewis and Clark used the Missouri River to use it. So you know the stretch and the potential, the scope of, of carp, uh, where they can go. So if we don't get a handle on it now as a national response, it's just going to get out of control to the point where uh, a lot of our fisheries and economic well-being on these river systems are going to be uh, severely impacted. Yeah, you know, last, uh, last September I went out to the Association of Great Lakes Outdoors Writers Conference in Bismarck, North Dakota. Um, which is out of Missouri there, actually, right where Lewis and Clark yeah. pass through. Yeah. And, you know, they, they talk about it there. They don't have them that far yet, but they have them into the Dakotas mm-hmm. already. And, you know, it's an issue that when I talked about it there, they're, they're, they're receptive to that message. They're already aware and know that they're coming their way. Yeah. You know, even all the way to Bismarck, North Dakota. That's right. So, yeah, this is truly an, a national issue. Yeah, they don't, they, carp don't stop swimming yeah. at state lines. They, they have no unless, prejudice. Unless there's a gauntlet of barriers um, where right. that state line is. 
Yeah. Um, so where does that stand now? The the final comment period has has closed, um, and that closed on uh, in in late February. Yeah. What's next for the brand and road plan, and and how can people listening to this podcast get involved and help advance it to the next step? Yeah. So it's hard not to talk about inside baseball stuff with this because there's so many moving parts with this. So I'm going to try to be as high level as possible because I can just get down in the weeds and, and lose everyone on this. But I, the, the the quick and short of it is that the core has to present its plan to Congress with a recommendation of what they want to do at Brandon Road. And in order for them to do that, they need to have a local partner uh, to share the cost of the project. In this case, at Brandon Road, since it's located in Illinois, and the state of Illinois owns a lot of the, the land in and around the lock at Brandon Road, Illinois is the natural local partner to share the burden of the cost. Um, so the trick is getting Illinois to sign on as a local partner to, to share some of the burden of paying for that cost. So. Uh, all the other Great Lakes states are working hard with Illinois to get them to the point where they can sign on as a sponsor. And then in order for that to happen, and so once that happens, then that report goes to Congress. Um, and what, what is the cost? Um, the, the overall cost that we keep hearing is $778 million. Yeah, that's um, the yeah that's the there, total cost of the project, and it, it, it's a it's a sticker shock. It, it is, but there there's some nuance to that cost. Um, yeah, you know, we put that in our comment letter. Could you break down a little bit of what that cost really entails and, and what it will more likely be? Yeah, so when the original draft came out, the the, the cost of this project was like around two hundred fifty million total, um, which is still no chump change, except. Considering some of the earlier proposals of physical separation, as we talked about earlier, were like, you know, 10, 15 billion. So $250 million to put a, put a barrier in is, is a bargain, considering the fact that we're having a $7 billion fishery in the Great Lakes. So um, over the course of the study, that cost has increased to about almost $800 million. But as part of that $800 million, there's a huge contingency of unknowns that the core has built in. Um, as and so that has jumped uh, the price of this thing up uh, that to 800 million. So approximately like 350 million of the cost is in contingency, uh, which is kind of the unknowns. What happens if you need more concrete, or what happens if you if you for this approach channel? What happens if you come across some chemicals that need to be remediated? So there's a huge unknown cost, which is which is fine to build in. But we've never have seen this large of an increase of, for contingencies. I mean, Marcy Capter from Toledo, a congresswoman, is in, in a hearing asking the Corps, we've never seen a contingency cost this high. Why is that? And the Corps doesn't really explain it very well because, well, it's unknown. So that, that explains some of the cost increase. But let's just, let's just say, heck, let's just say we get it cost $800 million. That still pales in comparison, and it's a bargain uh, if we can just uh, stop them at Brandon Road from getting into the Great Lakes because the cost of trying to manage them, remove them, it would far exceed the cost of at Brandon Road. So, um, so that that's part of the cost issues. The other thing that I would say is that the other the Great Lakes states lead, led by Michigan. It started with former Governor uh, Snyder um, led the charge to actually help Illinois pay those costs and there was there's eight million dollars sitting on the table right now uh that's put in by michigan illinois i'm sorry michigan <laughs> wisconsin minnesota even ontario has chipped in to help pay for the cost illinois portion of that um and there's still negotiations that i think are happening now because now there's a change of administrations a new governor in illinois who has a little bit different take on this and so we're we're here which could be a positive we're hearing only positive yeah. things and so um, so that that's that's hopeful that the cost will be shared amongst the Great Lakes states. So it's not just an Illinois burden. And, and we've all along have always said that this is not an Illinois problem. This is not a Great Lakes problem. This is a national problem. Therefore, the federal government should pick up the tab for the total cost of this. Um, Illinois needs to be on board to be there as a partner. But you know what? We're advocating hard for have removing any obstacle uh, of of paying for this from the state of Illinois. Illinois is not, um, and they're facing some serious fiscal challenges with their state. And so we want to uh, help out as much as we can. And we're pushing for full federal cost of this. So the U.S. government pays for the construction of this, 
The U.S. government pays for the operation and maintenance of this lock and dam in perpetuity. Um, that's what we're pushing for as a way to get this thing done. So that's kind of how much we're, we're expecting this to cost. Given all that inside baseball, these, um, these negotiations that still have to happen before this gets presented to Congress, what's the timeline like for once it gets presented to Congress, Congress then has to approve both the, <laughs> the pre-construction costs, they have to approve the funding, they have to approve the project. Okay, once that happens... Um, when are we looking at, at this getting built? Yeah, well, trying to guess how Congress acts is like, is, I need a crystal ball. And, you know, sometimes Congress doesn't even agree on anything. They can't even agree on the name, renaming a post office, let alone trying to fund a project as the, the large scale like this and as complicated as it is. But the, 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 the quickest way I could probably describe this is that if everything sails through, the Congress receives this report, let's just say in June, they receive it, and they move legislation to, to authorize this project, appropriate it at the levels it needs to be appropriated at, and then advances. Construction of this thing can start 2020, as early as 2020. Um, once construction starts, I think we're hearing approximately five years for completion. So um, whenever the construction starts, add five years on, and that seems forever, but we have tried to speed up the core projects forever, and we've always failed. The core is very meticulous. They have the certain things they have to do. So speeding up core projects is, is, is always one of our things, particularly for this project, is one of our highest priorities. But that's that's the, the, the timeline that they're, we're given. Um, now, that's assuming everything sails through swimmingly. Um, and so... But as soon, and that's that's the challenge we have before us. Is once this report gets to Congress, we're going to need everyone that we can find to advocate and push Congress to act urgently and fast as possible because carp are still swimming. You know, you know, as Congress sits around and wallows and does its business, carp are swimming and approaching the Great Lakes, and so we're going to need as much effort to move this as fast as possible and push Congress to act fast as possible. My guess is that'll probably be attached to some moving piece of legislation. Um, you know, there's there's a handful of infrastructure bills that could be coming up for um, that the Trump administration has talked about, the House Democrats have talked about. There, you know, there's a whole there's a, there's a suite of places where this could be attached to. It's not going to pass standalone. Um, so whatever vehicle that Congress can use to attach this, we're gonna we're gonna work it and work it hard. Um, but the timeline um, is really up in the air, given you know the the, the, the workings of how uh, Congress interacts with each other. I, d I do want to emphasize though that it's not too late. Um, I think sometimes you hear kind of the, the fatalistic um, because we've been hearing about it for about a decade. Sometimes you hear people say, "Well, it's too late." It's not too late, and even if it takes five years, it may still not be too late. We need Congress to act with urgency. We need the core to act with urgency. But really, when we talk about conservation, we talk about the long the long term outlook for our natural resources. Um, you know, think about when they do forest planning. When they do forest planning, they plan fifty years into the future. Um, when I look at this, let's say it takes five years for this to be completed, I'm thinking about what are the Great Lakes that that my son is going to inherit, that that your kids are going to inherit. Um, what is the condition of the Great Lakes going to be for them? And you know, Asian carp are not in the Great Lakes. Well, and and I think that's something that needs to be reemphasized. There are some grass carp in, in parts of Lake, Lake, Lake Erie, Erie um, but there are no big head and silver carp in the Great Lakes. Um, they have never found, they have not found any, um, and, and the biologists, um, the scientists, agencies do not believe that there are any, and they have not found any. So, what we're racing against is a timeline that Asian carp could get in and establish a population. Right. And so when you think about how long it may take them to do that, you know, we've had a few get past those barriers, um, but with those management actions, hopefully we can keep them from, from getting past in the large numbers that are, even though it doesn't take very many to establish a population. Let's say we could have kept them from establishing a population by 2030 or by 2028, 
and we didn't take this opportunity now that we have, we would be kicking ourselves then. Mm -hmm. We have the opportunity now, even though it's not going to be immediate, we have the opportunity now to put the system in place that will protect the condition of the Great Lakes and all their surrounding connected inland waters um, for the next generation. And, and to me, that's what conservation is all about. And so that's why we're fighting so hard to, to get this in now and make sure that Congress and the Corps acts with the urgency to make sure that it's not too late to stop them. That's right. Um, Amen. If, if you want more information about that, National Wildlife Federation, I think one of our strengths is that we collaborate with with other groups. You mentioned the 200 groups on there. We've also collaborated um, with several several both national and state-based groups um, in that are working in the Great Lakes region uh, to form the Great Lakes Conservation Coalition. And that's, this is a, an informal coalition that, that we've started with groups like Ducks Unlimited and Trout Unlimited and Michigan United Conservation Clubs, Wisconsin Wildlife Federation, Indiana Wildlife Federation, and Minnesota Conservation Federation, the Isaac Walton League of America, um, and, and several others. And what we've done there is put resources about Asian carp, um, both links and actions that you can take, um, and news and blogs um, and links to these organizations. And you can find those at greatlakesconservation.com. Um, I also want to thank Rep Your Water. Rep Your Water makes gear and apparel for fishing. And what they do is they donate 3% of their proceeds to conservation causes. For all of their Great Lakes gear, they actually donate that to us here at the Great Lakes uh, Regional Center of the National Wildlife Federation, specifically for our work on Asian carp. And we're actually collaborating um, on a special Asian carp um, ball cap for fishing. And we've already collaborated on a sticker that you can get um, to put on your uh, put on your boat, put on your cooler. Um, if you're like me, cover your back window of your SUV. Yeah. Um, Everyone Where, knows it's, everyone in town knows that's Drew Young Day driver. Right? Wherever you want, you know it's it's you know trout fishermen need trout stickers, and uh, no matter what you fish for, you've got something you can put that on. Um, both the sale of that and the upcoming collaboration on on the ball cap that every fisherman needs, fifty um, percent of that they're donating to us for our work on Asian carp as well. Um, you can find those at RepYourWater. Dot com. So thank you for our partners at Rep Your Water. Thank you for our partners um, of the other conservation organizations throughout the country working on this national issue. And once again, to find out more about how you can help stop Asian carp, go to GreatLakesConservation.com. Any parting words, Mark? Well, you know, we, I think you hit it on the head with the urgency. You know, we have been fighting this fight for a long time. We are sick and tired of waiting. We want something done. And I think that's just the sentiment I hear when I talk to my friends who hunt and fish, or even if you don't hunt and fish and you just enjoy the, the, the Great Lakes for why, for, for, for swimming and, and boating and just whatever. Um, you know, a lot of my friends ask me, what's going on with Asian carp? And they're like, we're still not figured it out yet? I mean, this is a country that has figured out so much in terms of technology. We, we put a man on the moon. Let's figure this out. And, you know, we have a plan to do it. You know, it's just, we got to get the, the will to do it. And, you know, we just need voices to push and push and push. Um, and there's no silver bullet here, but this plan is the best shot we have to keep carp out um, for our Great Lakes. This has been the National Wildlife Federation's Conservation Country Podcast. I'm your host, Drew Youngdike. Thanks for listening.